frontal attack by the enemy. So I thought I'd kind of uh, focus on stress tonight because, you know, we live in a world of stressors. Oh my goodness, we can't even get on the freeway without being stopped or taking two hours to go two miles in, in Houston. And I see people making faces and blaring on their horns and wanting to do things that aren't nice, and I know a lot of them are Christians that feel the frustration <laughs> on the freeway. Now, I, I, I got to read you a funny little, uh, funny little quip I found on the internet about a stressed out pastor. I thought it was really cute. A minister parked his car in a no parking zone in a large city because he was short on time and couldn't find a space with the meter. Then he put a note under his windshield wiper that read, I have circled this block 10 times. If I don't park here, I'll miss my appointment. Forgive us our tras trespasses. When he returned, he found a citation from a police officer along with a note that said, I've circled this block for 10 years. If I don't give you a ticket, I'll le lose my job. Lead us not into temptation. <laughs> <laughs> and you heard about the, the woman driver that was on a guy's tail. She was tailgating him really, really close. And the light turned yellow, and so he stopped. And, oh, she was stuck behind him. She wanted to get through that intersection so bad. She was just being ugly. She was honking at him and flipping him off and doing all sorts of horrible things. Well, the light turned green, and the guy went on through. But she heard a knock on her window, and there was a police officer sir standing there and he told her out of the car please and she said what are you arresting me for he said hands on the car you know and then he cuffed her and he took her off to jail and put her in her cell and she just couldn't understand what the heck she was arrested for I mean she'd been an you know, a nasty driver, but it wasn't anything illegal. And he came back a couple hours later and he said, I'm really sorry that I arrested you. It was a, uh, uh, a matter of mistaken identity. You see, I saw that um, <clears throat> pro-life sticker and that, that fish on the back of your car and the bumper sticker that said, follow me to church. And I just assumed the car was stolen. <laughs> so... I know it's corny, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> we are bombarded on every side by stress, and I'll, I'm going to read you a few things about stress that I found out in the dictionary and in the Word. First of all, can we live a stress-free life? And of course, Christians can. The answer is yes, but the bigger question is how. First of all, what is stress and what causes it? The dictionary defines stress as a state of mental tension and worry caused by problems in your life or work. The second definition is something that causes strong feelings of worry or anxiety or an outside physical force or pressure. As Christians, we have, li we have stress in our jobs, in our relationship with our co-workers and family, providing for our families, competing with others in the workplace or in the school for those uh, high positions and scholarships. We have stress about, I know this is true for young people, the way we look, the way we feel, the way we're, the way we're viewed by others, the way we behave because young people especially compare themselves to what they see on television and in magazines. And our young people today are under a tremendous amount of stress to compete. Okay? The Mayo Clinic advises that stress can cause headaches, muscle tension, chest pain, fatigue, changes in sex drive, stomach upset, sleep problems, anxiety, restlessness, lack of motivation, depression, over or under eating, drug or alcohol abuse, and social withdrawal. If these symptoms are left unchecked, they can actually cause cancer, immunodeficiency diseases, heart attacks, and strokes. So, you know, stress on the surface doesn't look like a big stronghold, but it can become one if we don't deal with it and if we don't recognize it right away. See, I believe it's the devil's way of getting us, kind of chipping us off a little bit at a time, bringing one stress after another stress, because 
that second or that third uh, physical force or pressure that comes against us that's what stress is defined as for the christian it's a spiritual force that comes against us and we all know that in romans 12 2 it says don't be conformed to this world fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs but be transformed by the entire renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The word conformed means to be shaped and molded and stuffed into a container or a mold. That's what the world does to the Christian. It chips away at us and tries to make us conform to its standard of living, whereas God said, renew your mind in my word and you'll be transformed, which is the butterfly coming from the worm, changing into a new man, a whole new creation, a new, new nature of being that's never been before. So how do we deal with stress? You know how we deal with stress? It's like Pastor said Sunday, we've got everything that God's ever going to give us. We've got the Holy Spirit. We've got the word of, we've got the word of our testimony. We've got the blood of Jesus. We've got the armor. We've got all the tools we'll ever need to compete or to actually defeat the enemy in this world. So when we come up against stress, and you can feel it in the back of your neck. I know I can. When I'm at work sometimes, I'll just need to stop and stretch my neck, and I know it's from tension and stress. What we do is we make a decision. See, people think we're really, I mean, we think we're really victims and kind of helpless in this world because so much comes against us. But let me ask you a question. When you met Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior, weren't you required to make a decision? And didn't you decide to follow him? You could have walked away. The decision was totally up to you. And we can do that same thing in our lives every single day. It just comes down to one decision at a time. If we will stand on the word and use those those. Uh, use those uh, tools that the word and the Lord and the and the armor and everything is given us, we can make the decision to stand in God's word and then Jesus will deliver us. We don't have to do anything. All we have to do is believe that God is able to take care of all our needs, even, even our stressors. But the important thing is, is that we have to recognize it. There's, you know, there's the old covenant and there's the new covenant. And under the old covenant, it depended on what you did, what God would do. In other words, if you will obey the law, I will bless you. Like the young ruler in Luke 18 that came to the Lord and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, Jesus was a man walking under the old covenant, and he said, well, you have to obey the commandments, and he read him to the young man, and he said, this I've done all of these since my youth, and he said, one thing you lack, go and sell all that you have and come follow me. So under the old covenant, to get eternal life, it was you do, and then God will do. That Even Jesus told him that, well, you do this, and you'll get eternal life based on your behavior, whereas in Acts 16.30, when Silas and Paul were in the jail and all the walls shook and the gates flung open and the jailer went out to kill himself, Paul said, don't do that, we're all still here. I imagine it was very dark in that jail too. Now this is on the other side of the cross. And he came and he bowed in front of Paul and Silas. He goes, what must I do to be saved? Technically, it's the same question that the young ruler asked under the Old Covenant. You know what Paul's answer was? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? The Old Covenant's passed away. It's not based on what we do. It's based on who we believe in. And it's based on a decision. So don't be conformed and molded and look like everybody else, even out there on the road. And believe me, I'm preaching to myself <laughs> because I get really frustrated going to and from work. And I've had a lot of tests the last couple of days. Yesterday on the way home, there was a truck 
just stopped in the middle lane right over where all that construction is at Community Drive, and it was backed up all the way to Kingwood, so it took me an hour and a half to go 20 miles. <laughs> then this morning I was coming into work and it was dead stop at North Park. Praise the Lord, I get off at North Park coming south. So. And then tonight on the way home, it was closed. The freeway was closed going north in Cleveland, and I'm just going, oh, my Lord, God, how many tests am I going to get this week? <laughs> but I'll tell you, I passed them all. I just relaxed. You know, a righteous man's step or ordered by the Lord. I figured he was protecting me, and I wasn't going to get anywhere I wasn't supposed to be until he saw that it was time to get there. So I've had a lot of tests about that. So let's see about what the Word says about believing for God to mold us into Him, his image and not be conformed to the world, but transformed, and not let these things like stress make us look like everybody else, because we're supposed to be better than that. We're supposed to be different than that. It's like Chris said, if people don't see it in us, who are they going to see it in? We're the answer. We've got everything the world will ever need. Every person, there's healing, there's salvation, there's resurrection. Oh my goodness, do you know how much you carry around inside of you every day? Because you're not only in Christ. He's in us. We're in him, but he's in us, and we can do the same things that he did if we love people and don't look like everybody else. If we're different, it will draw those people to us, and it's really hard not to be like the whole world when we're bombarded by television and newspapers and magazines and those terrible inquirers at the store at the checkout and the news everything is so depressing everywhere we look we see the world the world the world no hope just terrible things going on it's really difficult to maintain peace and to maintain consistency but we can if we we'll just believe the Lord I mean we are all going to make mistakes we can take one step forward and sometimes take two back but it's not based on what we do anymore. It's based on the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony. What's our word going to be? I believe. You can help me change, Lord. You can make me more like you. I can't do it because I'm all stressed out and I look like everybody else. But you can help me. So in Philippians 4, 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything... By prayer and petition and thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Another thing that Pastor Tom said Sunday is that praise and worship really does lift our spirits. If we're in a dark place and we begin to sing praise the Lord, just like Paul's telling us to do here, it will lift that oppression and that stress and we'll be comforted in the presence of God. It, it, we've got everything we need to change the circumstances in our lives. James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it, pre, it pure joy, my brethren, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance must finish it's work so that you may have, so that you may be mature and complete men, not lacking anything. In other words, the trials make us stronger. They make us harder. It's just like working your muscles. The more you work out, the stronger you become. So trials are part of our life, and they're good for us because every time we're in a trial and we persevere and we stay true to God and his word, we're going to come out the victor every time. And James says if you do this over and over again, you're going to grow up into the full stature of Christ, a mature man, and you're not going to lack anything. That's a wonderful promise. Is anybody lacking anything tonight? I can think of a bunch of stuff I'm lacking. I want to, I want to be like the guy in James. So we need to persevere. When we have stress, the psalmist said about the Lord, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. I love that. That's Psalm 9419. Pastor Tom also talked about the anointing of the Lord being an easy yoke 
and it does destroy the yoke of bondage. It does not break it, it destroys it. So, Paul said in Romans 16, 20, I love this one, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So I'm going to conclude it tonight and just say, well, that sounds, some of us might be thinking, well, you don't know what I've gone through. You just don't know how much I hurt inside or how nervous I am. You know, there's a lot of people that take Xanax and all kinds of antidepressants in the world today because they have such a hard time dealing with life. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing because we all have times in our lives when, you know, medical a diagnosis may be appropriate. I mean, I did after my mother died. I had to take Xanax for about two or three months because I was in such a state of anxiety and depression. But after a while, God delivered me after about three months, and I just quit taking them one day. And they, the doctor said, how'd you do that? I said, well, what do you mean, how did I do that? I just stopped him. He goes, well, they're highly ex uh, addictive. But God delivered me. I didn't feel a need to have him anymore because the joy of the Lord had returned again. You know, I mean, he's faithful. But I know that any of us can overcome any battles or anything that we're facing in life, and especially our young people. We need to let them know that they don't need to conform to the world. The world needs to conform to them. We've got everything that it's going to take to get the job finished. We're here. We're the body of Christ. We're part of him. Again, he's in me. The miracle worker, the healer, the man who walked on water, the man who fed 5,000 with two, two fish and two loaves. I mean, he's inside of me. Can I do those things? Yes, I believe I can do those things. And I am going to change the world one person at a time. I don't want to live like the stress-filled world and like the other people. I want my light to shine and I want to be different. So it's a battle, constant battle. Don't give up. Just keep standing on the word and rejoicing and singing and praising the Lord and recognize stress for what it is when it comes. It's just a tool of the enemy trying to get you into a stewed tomato can instead of you becoming a butterfly. So recognize that when he comes and don't give him a place. We're not ignorant concerning his wiles, Paul said. We're not ignorant. Satan's not got anything new. He's not creative. He's a dead spirit. He's got nothing new. So just beware of him because he goes around like a lion roaring, but he's a toothless lion. Okay? <laughs> okay. Thank you.